You know, and I do pray that is your prayer tonight, that you are inviting the Holy Spirit to know more of Him. And uh, Chuck, thank you for singing that song because it really just fits really well in with tonight's message. If you got your Bibles, I pray you'd open up to Genesis chapter 9. And uh, I didn't want to pass these notes out just yet. And so Mike is passing them out now because I didn't want you to think this is going to be a repeat from Sunday, this morning's message. <laughs> As you can see on the top of your hand out there when you receive it, that, uh, that the message sort of is going to coattail off of this morning's message. And uh, I have had many comments about the sermon this morning. Um, and, uh, and I'm thankful that it has, has stirred people to look, search deeply within them and and to, uh, to seek the face of God in these matters as, as, uh, as we talk about the Holy Spirit and getting to know Him more and, and, and more of His presence. Uh, verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 5 says these words, And be not drunk with wine as in excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what he meant by that from Ephesians chapter 5 is, is that the Holy Spirit ought to be able to take control of your life and do what in excess of alcohol would do, which would cause you to do things you don't normally do do. How many of y'all ever had a, a life before Christ? Raise your hand. How many of y'all ever had a life before Christ when you were intoxicated? Raise your hand. Did you always, were you always in control? Did you ever do anything that you would not have normally done outside of that state of inebriation? Okay, so some of y'all be honest in here and say, yes, I did do that. Some people would ask me the next morning, hey, man, do you know what you did last night? And I'd say, uh, no, and don't tell me. <laughs> I don't want to know, probably. And, uh, but, but, but what should happen with the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit ought to cause us to do things that we normally would not do on our own because we're no longer under the control of our own spirit. We're under the control of the Holy Spirit. Amen? I say, I'm no longer in the control of the spirits. I'm in the control of the Spirit, capital S. Amen? And so he causes me to do all kinds of things that I would have never done before, seek out things I would have never sought out before. God has changed my life. Can you give a testimony to that? Say amen. amen. And so as we now look over, though, the reason I say that is because in Genesis chapter 9, that's where we're going to be in the study of our, of our study, where we are now in the, in, the, in the walking through verse by verse of the book of Genesis. And you're going to see here uh, that the beginning of verse 18 is the time uh, of chapter 9 is when God has now brought Noah all the way through the flood, uh, through the waiting and, uh, and finally the resting on Mount Ararat, where then he sent out the doves and the ravens, and finally the dove did not come back, and so he knew it was safe to look out, and he looked out, and the land was dry, and now God is sending them forth out of the ark. Okay, so we know where we are now in Genesis chapter 19. But I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 6 as we begin. But I just want you to put your finger there at Genesis chapter 9 and verse 15 because that's where we're going to pick up. But I want us to remind ourselves of where we've come from. And that really needs to happen in Genesis chapter 6 and pick up there with me in verse 5. Because this is the problem that caused the flood and no one is to have to go into the ark in the first place. And the Bible says these words. And God saw the wickedness of man was very great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil, evil continually all the day long. And it repented of the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it has repented me that I have made them. But praise God for verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Would you pray with me this with tonight? Father, as we come to your word, as we have been instructed from the word this morning, and as we come back to find more instruction and guidance for our heart, may the Holy Spirit increase his presence here. May we long to know him more and have him to cause us to do the things in which you have prepared for us from the foundations of the earth that we should walk in them. In the soberness of our hearts and our minds, being aware of our adversary who walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Oh God, give us wisdom in these last days to seek the face of the God who can save us 
and the God who can rescue us and the God who can revive us and the God who can renew us, the God who can turn the things around if we would just come back and worship you and be not divided in our hearts with the things of this world and the things in which you had prepared for us. And so, Father, we thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit. We thank you that it does speak to us as we open up your word. Oh, God, speak to us tonight. And it's in your precious name that I pray. And everybody said. Amen. So in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, we have this major issue that, man, the wickedness of, of man had, had grown evil continually all the day long. And it had broke the heart of God because everything that God had given to man, man had twisted and perverted and used it for his own benefit. And it's called wickedness. It's called wickedness. And the Bible says that God wanted to destroy man off the face of the earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And now as we pick up now Genesis chapter 9. I have titled the top of this thing, Nothing Good Comes from Intoxication. Okay? Nothing good comes from intoxication. Um, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Because I want you to notice why I, know, why, I, why I make that the heading. And look what it says in verse 18 of Genesis chapter 9. And the sons of Noah that were... That went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. And these are the three sons uh, of Noah. And of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman. And he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was, say it with me, drunken. Drunk. He drank of the wine and he was drunken. <laughs> Listen to me, church. If you drink of the wine, you are drunken. The Bible is very clear. Uh, but as I said this morning, we have to also make sure that we're clear that when the Bible calls wine, wine it's not always talking about that which will make you drunk. As I said this morning, the Bible says that while the grapes are hanging on the vine, it is wine. Okay, so before it's ever even squeezed out of there, the grape and everything that comes out of there when it's squeezed is wine. And that wine then, if, you'll, if, you'll, if you will think with common sense with me, why is it that you don't walk into the wine stores or the liquor stores and find other fruit juices as wine? Remember, in the days of the Bible, in the days in which the Bible was written, we didn't have refrigeration nor preservatives. And anyone with common sense would know this, that if you take a grape and you squeeze it, you can leave it sit. Now listen, it's going to turn into alcohol, and you can drink it. The consequences of that, though, is that you're going to get drunk, not normally die. If you do that with any other fruit under the sun, and you leave it sit like you leave grapes to sit, and you drink it later on, guess what's going to happen to you? You're most likely going to die because it turns into poison, okay? It can't. It can't hold for days and weeks at a time where the fruit of the vine can. But the longer the fruit of the vine sits and waits, it does what? It ferments. It does it naturally. Where the other fruits of the trees or other things, you have to actually add other things into it. And it begins the process. And sometimes you can, you can make alcohol, but most of the time it just turns into what we call gut rot, literally. And it will make you absolutely sick and kill you. Nowhere on the face of the planet. But listen, men across the face of the planet will make liquor and wine out of just about anything they can, okay? From one who was in prison, okay? You're not allowed to drink in jail. Anybody know that? Okay? But guess what, guess what you can always get in jail? You can always get something to drink. Because <laughs> the men will take all the food that we get, all the juices and all the fruit, and put it in a bag with all the bread and some sugar, and guess what it makes? <laughs> liquor. <laughs> Okay, so man all over the face of the planet. Now, when I went to Ecuador, guess what Ecuador would do? They would get this stuff, and, uh, and it was a root out of the ground, and it was called chicha. It was called a chicha plant. And they would take the root out of the ground, and they would dig that root up, and they would chew it in their mouth uh, with the root, and they would chew it up and mix it with their saliva. And then they would spit that in a bucket, and then they would add water to it, and then they would cover that up and let it sit. Guess what would happen? It would turn into... Chicha! <laughs> and all the people love chicha! Let's get some chicha! Woo! The chicha will light you up. <laughs> it will light your world up. It's like the strong drink. It ain't just, but it's just from a, a man will find a way 
to escape from the realities of the world by whatever means necessary he can do that, right? And so here you have this wonderful story of God basically pushing a reset button on society and getting rid of all the wickedness. Is that not what's going on in Genesis chapter 6 to always to verse 19? Uh, uh, all the way to verse 18 of Genesis chapter 9? I mean, God has pushed the reset, reset button, y'all. Listen to me. How many people were saved? Y'all don't even know. Anybody here got biblical common sense or biblical wisdom in here to know how many people were saved out of all the people on the earth? Five, nine. <laughs> there was eight. <laughs> There was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Amen. That makes a total of eight. So there were eight people out of all the earth that God was willing to save because the wickedness of man's heart was evil continually all the day long. And then, friends, I want you to know that as soon as they come off the ark, and one of the first things that began to decline the heart of man again was the issue in which we dealt with this morning <laughs> at the end of the sermon. That was not really meant to be the whole sermon. Okay, but it did turn out that there was. But they were supposed to start over. Was that not the point? And so if you're writing down your little notes, I just wrote, uh, you know, they were supposed to start over. But I said they were to reset, not relapse. Because <laughs> that's exactly what happened here. It was supposed to be a reset going back to what righteousness. Because evil continually all the day long. And God says, I'm going to start over. I'm going to take this righteous one named Abraham. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 6 and listen to what the Bible says about, I mean, uh, about Noah. Sorry, not Abraham. About Noah. Genesis chapter 6. Notice what it says. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And these are the gener generations of Noah. And Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah, what? Walk with God. I mean, here's a man who walked with God. Here's a man that the Bible, that God himself says he was a just man. I mean, listen, I don't know about y'all, but I, I'm praying and hoping that God is writing words like this about me. How about you? Because you do know that God is writing down your story too, right? He said, all of your members were written down in my book ever before there was ever one fashioned. He says, don't you know that I hold the te your tears in the jars in heaven? I mean, God's not only writing your story, he's catching your tears. Ain't that a joyful thing? That God knows the numbers of hairs on your head. Some of y'all got less now than you did before, but it still don't matter. He still knows, right? But God, God, is in, man, God loves us. Do y'all know that? And we ought to love God as much. And so the Bible comes along in the New Testament and says these words, Whether you eat or drink, do it all to the what? And we just sang the song, y'all. And that's why I say, I don't pick this subject. God's bringing it out right before your eyes, and we're dealing with it all at once. So guess what? No more Well, I talk about this subject. But well, guess what? For two Sundays, in, two messages in a row on Sunday, we're going to talk about the intoxicating beverage called wine. Secondly, they didn't have a lot of drink options back in the day. Did you know that? And so they had wine because wine was the only thing that could last in which they could drink. But they knew that in the process of time, the longer it sat, the more intoxicating it would get. So that's why they would come along and say, don't drink much of it. <laughs> only drink a little of it. Why? Because if you keep drinking, that's what's going to happen. You're going to get drunk. But when we go to the store, listen to me, it's not that we go to the store and buy it so that uh, it's, you know, like, well, darn, why didn't you tell me it wasn't fresh squeezed? <laughs> like I got home, I didn't realize how long that thing had been sitting, right? No, when we go to the store and we buy it, we want to buy it, we want it. And the real wine, the, the real money wine is the wine that has been sitting for what? A long time, right? Isn't them really expensive bottles of wine like you, this was made in like 1876 or something like that? <laughs> yep. Okay for y'all wine drinkers in here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, you go to the, you, go, you can go get the $5 bottle of wine, okay? It's, it's not that great, but you get a really good expensive wine. It's been sitting there a long time. It's been fermenting. It's been in the process for a long time. And people say it's like women gets sweeter with time, Amen. <laughs> Or marriage, I mean, sorry. Not, not that. that was a misquote, sorry, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> marriage gets better with time. <laughs> now, all y'all just laugh, because most of y'all say, mm -hmm, what, you've been married for 30 years, bro, so you ain't going to be so happy anymore. <laughs> I'm like, man, I'm happier now with my marriage than I was when I started with my marriage, amen? I don't know what's wrong with people's marriages. To have to say that about your marriage is quite a tragedy. Because as the Bible says, if you do your marriage right, it's the closest thing to heaven you have here on the earth. If you do it wrong, it's the closest thing to hell on earth. And that's what most people are doing. That's the reason they have a bad thing to say about marriage. One thing I found when, I, when, I, when we were getting married is I, 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 went, I wanted to find some couples that had been married for a long time. And I said, I want y'all just to sit down with us and, and, and y'all tell us about marriage and how you've made it work so well. And, and man, give us some wisdom. And, and, and most of them didn't have anything really positive to say about marriage. 
And it was even hard to find people who had been stayed married. <laughs> right? And so I thought that's a, that's a tragedy because something so, so special to the heart of God. God finds it as a picture of Christ in the church. And we talk about it like it's, like it's a terrible thing. Like, why would you ever want to do that? You're going to ruin your life. You're, you're fixing the life's coming to an end when you get married. And I think, man, my goodness, what a tragedy. But you see how we take everything that God gives to us for good and we turn it into some perverted, twisted thing? Man, marriage is a good thing. Let me tell you, grape juice is a good thing. Orange juice is a good thing. Pineapple juice is a good thing. Apple juice is a good thing. But don't you know you can take a good thing and turn it into a bad thing? And so certainly as we see here, man, I tell you, Noah was a just man and perfect in this generation. And Noah walked with God. And then the very next thing you see, right when they come off the ark, go back with me to chapter 9. Golly, look at it. I mean, look at the, look what started the downward progression once all over again. They were supposed to start over. They were supposed to reset, not relapse. And then all of a sudden, here it is. Noah began to be a husband, verse 20. And he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was what? Uncovered. In his tent. Perfect, just, righteous Noah. And what was his downfall? A little too much of fermented wine. And the next thing you know, he's laying naked and bare in his tent. Do you reckon that was his aim? Do you reckon that was his goal? When he started... No, I can't say that that had to be. Because the first thing that Noah did do when he got off the ark was he built an ark first, right? He built an altar. I mean, sorry. Is that not the first thing he did? He built an altar and he sacrificed unto the Lord and said, Lord, thank you for sparing me, man. Thank you for, for letting us start over. And man, for 120 years, Noah preached what? Righteousness. righteousness. And what was the downfall of Noah's righteousness? Intoxicating beverage. You tell me it's not a problem, y'all. Listen to me. It's a problem. It's a problem. Men love their flesh rather than the glory of God. And if you can tell me in any which way by drinking an intoxicated beverage brings glory to God, then I say, let's go get a bottle and let's get it on. I can't find one way ever that drinking wine, fermented, alcoholic wine, brings glory to God. Not one. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. Proverbs would say it like this. Be not amongst the wine bibbers and the gluttons. Because <laughs> eating too much food is the same thing as being amongst the wine bibbers. <laughs> it's not a good thing. And the Bible does forbid it. And I want to ask you here, I, 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 I've been in Bible study and Thursday night Bible study because we were talking about this issue in Thursday night Bible study. And, you know, this topic comes up, and anytime this topic comes up, it's one of those hairline, hair-raising topics like women and pastors, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and I said, if, if the Bible says, how many of y'all have ever heard that the Bible says, nowhere in the Bible does it say you can't drink? Anybody here heard that before? Raise your hand. Okay. So, if, if I was to show you in the Bible one time where God says it's not good to drink, that you shouldn't drink, would you believe God instead of me? Anybody? Did y'all go for that? Good, I'm glad you did. <laughs> Turn to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. If I could just show you once in Scripture where God says don't touch the fermented alcoholic beverage. Drink as much grape juice as you want, apple juice, orange juice, pineapple juice. But once it comes to the point of fermentation, leave it alone. Because it's poison. It's poison. Proverbs chapter 23. <clears throat> now, I'm going to ask you another question before we start this. It starts in verse 26. Look at me. Would anybody in here, would anybody in here permit me a little bit of a little bit of adultery or fornication with a prostitute uh, every now and then? Would anybody permit that? Why not? Okay. I just want to know that because he's fixing to compare two things. I want you to pick it up. Verse 26. My son. Give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. For a whore is a deep ditch. 
That's a prostitute, okay? So a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth and wait for her prey, and increaseth the transgressions amongst men. So a whore or a prostitute, not trying to be vulgar, this is what the Bible's language says, okay? It's literal translation, all right? So I'm not using words that are not biblical words. It's what the Bible says right here. He says, listen, don't you go messing around with those kind of women because they're going to get you in what? They're going to get you in trouble. Now, who's writing this letter? This is Solomon. This is David's son, Solomon. And do y'all know that Solomon was the most wisest man who ever lived on the face of the planet? That God himself says, I'm going to make you the wisest man that has ever lived? And do you not know that Solomon wrote and said that he had given his flesh to, her, to withhold... He withhold his flesh from no pleasure under heaven. Okay? And then he came along and he was asking God to give him wisdom to lead his people as he became the king of Israel. And God says, Solomon, what do you want? And Solomon says, I don't want fame. I don't want riches. I don't want... All I want is wisdom to know how to lead your people. And God says, Solomon, because you asked for that, I'm going to make you the wisest man on the earth and I'm going to give you all those things. And Solomon did have them, don't you know? I mean, the crazy man had 300 wives, 400 wives and 300 concubines. And yet he's saying here, a strange woman is a, is a narrow pit. <laughs> it's danger. Don't go there, my son. He's warning about the same things in which he's already experienced. Do you understand that? He's saying, don't follow my, don't follow my example. Listen to, my, listen to me, what I'm telling you now. A whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She lies awake and pray. And what's it say here? And increase of the transgressions amongst men. So what happens when you start playing with this stuff? It degrades society. Is that not true? Say amen. Amen. Okay. So now pick up with me. Now he jumps. He goes straight from that right into verse 29. Who hath woe and who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babblings, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the... They that tarry long at the... And they that go after the what? Mixed wine. Mixed wine. Now, I'm about to show you where the Bible says you ought not to drink. Y'all ready? Because here, the word wine in verse 30 is from the very first moment that it squeezes until it gets to the point where it is mixed, where it is, it is fermentation. But look at verse 31 and look at it and read it very clearly with me. Here's what he says. Don't drink the wine when it's red. Is that what your Bible says? Look at me. No. What's it say? Don't look at it. Oh, so the Bible doesn't say not only no, don't drink it. He says what? Don't even look at it. Now, what am I supposed to not to look at? When am I not supposed to look at the wine? Okay, now watch what it says. Listen to what it says. When it is red, and when it gets its color in the cup, and when it what? When it stirs itself aright. When the fermentation process begins, do not even look at it. He didn't say don't drink it. He said don't even what? Now, hold on. Is this Brother Toby saying this? Solomon. Okay, but now who's really, who's really writing behind Solomon? God is. So God in his wisdom, passing it through the heart and mind of Solomon, who had also messed up in a lot of, of areas, because that's why I say, I don't know how in the world God can call Solomon the most wisest man in the world if he had 700 wives. That's the craziest man in the world. How in the world? I don't know. But that's what the Bible says. But God is writing these words and he says, man, listen, don't drink the wine when it turns red and it moves itself in the cup. Why? Why? Because notice what it says here. Pick up and see. He says, and at last it biteth like a what? How many of y'all would pick up a snake and let it bite you? No? Well, Solomon is saying, or God is saying through Solomon in his wisdom, that when you drink the fermented wine, it's like picking up a snake and letting it what? Oh, but no one would dare do that, no. And yet, we do it, and we not only do it, but we pay to get it done. And every time we pay, every time we buy a bottle of this poison that goes into your system, and has it not, has it not increased the transgressions amongst men? Has it not increased sin? Has it not degraded society in a most heinous way? This thing in which we call fermentation or alcohol is a terrible thing. It has ruined more families and more lives than anything else on the face of the planet. And yet we as Christians, 
ought to live our lives above those things which degrade society. And if it's not okay to go out and have a little prostitution every now and then, as Solomon would say, then it ought not to be good to go out and have a little bit of fermented wine every now and then. Why? Because, listen, it may not bite you or hurt you now, but I promise you, sooner or later, if you get bit by the poison snake, you're going to what? It's going to hurt. <laughs> you're going to get sick. And look at society and what it's done. And so he says, now watch what he says, what happens. He says, now watch, you, 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 because I say he keeps going back and forth between prostitution and drinking, right? So that's what he says. He comes right out of that. He says, at last it biteth like a serpent, stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold what? Strange, Strange women. And thine heart shall what? You say things you ought not to say, and you do things you ought not to do when you mess with the stuff that stirs us itself a right in the cup. So wine, when it's first squeezed, you have no problem with that. When it comes out, matter of fact, it's pure. Now, notice I put on there, nothing ever good comes from intoxication. So if you put toxins in your body, what are you putting in your body? Because now we go through this process where I'm de-what? I'm de-what my body? I'm detoxifying my body. So I'm pulling out all the things that are what? Not good, right? They're bad things. And yet they'll say, man, that dude was intoxicated. Why? Because he put poison in. Because that's exactly what Proverbs 23 says. That when you drink it, it's like a serpent and it bites you and it puts what in you? Poison in you. It's like a spider. How many of y'all ever been bit by a spider in here? Did that feel good? Did you like that process? And the Bible says this is what happens when you drink this stuff. Now, I'm not saying this. I'm just trying to make a case for the glory of God. But God says, listen, when it stirs itself aright, don't even look at it because it's going to bite. It bites. It's poison. It's deadly. And it's killing people. It's destroying families. And every time you buy a bottle, guess what you're saying? Keep on making it. Keep on making it. I can take it. I can drink it. And you know what the Bible says? Do not eat meat nor drink wine and cause a brother to stumble. 1 Corinthians. Because you may be able to drink one glass and it'd be fine. But there may be a brother and sister who can't drink one glass and it's not fine. It destroys their family. They become a drunk. And the next thing you know, they're at AA. And they're trying to figure out how to get their life back together. But for you, it's fine. I'm strong. And the Bible says, man, you ought to be strong for your weaker brother. And put away the things of the flesh that lead someone else astray. And when we say it's okay, all we're doing is adding to the transgressions amongst men. Just like you would say that prostitution is not good. You ought to be able to look around and see the transgressions of men that alcohol has done and say alcohol is not good. As a whole, it's not good. And I realize you have the freedom to do whatever you want to do. For you are free in Christ. But for the sake of the world and the souls of men, we ought to put off the flesh. Amen. The Bible says, therefore, mortify your members upon the earth. The Bible says, men, listen, uh, do not gratify the lust of the flesh. There's a thousand things you can drink that doesn't lead to problems like that. You're not like it was in the days of Israel when all they had was water or wine. They had two options or maybe some fresh goat's milk. <laughs> How many of y'all hear about goat's milk, Ray Jan? How many of y'all like goat's milk? Huh? Well, most of y'all, mm -mm. So I don't like goat's milk, but how many of you ladies in here would like to walk three or four miles to the center of town with a bucket on your head and get water? Okay? So guess what was readily available for them? And that's why the Bible says not much wine. When it, says, when it does say not much wine, you know why? Because I don't know how long it's been hanging on your wall sitting there fermenting, but if you drink a lot of it after that fermentation process has started, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get drunk. And as I said, the Bible's very clear that drunkenness is a what? It's very, it's very clear, brothers and sin. And so for the sake of brothers and sisters around you, listen, don't be like Noah. <laughs> don't be like Noah. And don't lead people in the wrong direction. Because I want you to see what happened, man. Listen, they failed the sobriety test. I'll just put that down. If you're, I just, I'm just trying to be funny and play on words, okay? <clears throat> Genesis, 9, Genesis 9, go back there now. By the way, that is one time where the Bible says, don't drink, okay? So you do with it as you will from there. And you can't use John chapter 2 anymore, as you saw from this morning. So, at least I hope you got that. 
So in, in chapter 9, watch out what it says in verse 20. And Noah began to be a husbandman. Nothing wrong with the grapes. How many of y'all love to eat grapes right here? Raise your hand. I love some good grapes. And them grapes, the, man, the grapes are sweet. It's, it's the worst fruit for a diabetic. Did you know that? Yeah. It's got the greatest sugar content in it out of all the other fruits. Isn't that something? Not good for a diabetic at all. And so he says, and Noah began to be a vine, a husbandman, which is it's a farmer, but it's, it's particularly in the issue of, of planting a, a vineyard, a grape orchard. And then notice what he says. It doesn't say how long it took that process, but he says he drank of the wine, and he was drunken, and he was uncovered in his tent. The very first sin of man outside the salvation and the miracle work of God was what? Drunkenness. They failed the sobriety test. God says, I'm starting over. Stay alert. Stay on guard. Do not fall. Do not go down that path again. And they failed. The very first sobriety test was given. And you tell me that it's not a, an ill of society? It's a terrible ill of society. And that's why I say I know there are those who will argue against me all day long. And I, I, I pray for them, brothers and sisters in Christ. Man, listen. We're to hold ourselves to a high standard of living. Amen? High standard of living. But then notice what it says. In Ham, okay? Now, not only did he fail his sobriety test, but he caused others to fall with him in this falling. Now, notice what it says. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. This was a tragedy, okay? Because God says the nakedness was a problem, did he not? If you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and they found out they were naked and they said, oh, shoot, we're naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and God said, oh, no, that ain't going to work. You can't cover up your own what? Sin. So therefore, I'm going to make skin for you, clothes for you, and you're going to cover yourself up properly. Amen? And so for someone to show off their nakedness, it was a great tragedy. It was a great uh, reversal of God saying the shame and the, and, and, the, and the guiltiness is now upon you. And now here's Noah, this righteous one. And what got him <laughs> to fall this far? A little bit of wine. Hot dog. And then his son had to fall with him because I want you to see what happened to this one who saw his, saw his father like this. And Ham, the, the, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Sham and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went in backwards. And so they go into the tent. He comes out and tells them about it. And they go, oh, no, Ham, that's not good. And so they take a garment, put it on one shoulder. Someone's standing over there, put it on their shoulder. And they walk backwards into the tent. Because this is a great tragedy laying in here. And they cover their father up. But now watch what happens. Watch what happens. And they walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backwards. And they saw not their what? They saw not their father's nakedness. Now you want to see how far this alcohol issue runs right here? Look at the next verse. And Noah awoke from his wine. And he knew what his younger son had did. And he said, Cursed. Be Canaan. Y'all, do you see the tragedy in this one instance of dropping the guard just one minute and getting a little bit of relax? I'm sure Noah had been stressed out. He'd been in an ark with four women and three sons for almost two years, almost a year and a half. <laughs> I mean, almost a little over. A little over a year, half a year, I mean. Three quarters of a year. He'd been trapped in his ark. All the crazy stuff had gone on. Man, the destruction that happened all around him. And he gets out of that ark. I'm sure he's just like, whew, man, I'm glad that's over with. I need, to, I need a break. I need to relax a little bit. Let me go over and get me what? A drink. Let me go get me a drink. And what happened? And what happened? A whole generation of people was cursed so I said huh, they were supposed to start over they failed the sobriety test <laughs> and it was downhill from there do y'all understand I mean do y'all really understand like look I didn't pick this text tonight you know how long we've been walking through this book 
I didn't know I was going to be here when I started First and Second Timothy, nor Titus on Thursday nights. But guess where we're at in every one of those studies, from Thursday night to Sunday morning to Sunday night? Guess where we're at? Right on this subject. And one of the reasons is because now the ministers of God are now inviting the people to drink with them. Now the ministers of God are starting to invite the people to drink with them. If you don't think this is a problem, my friends, you need to get on your face and pray to the God of heaven and earth. Because let me tell you, toxins is something that is not good. And if you're intoxicated, it's not good. Amen? And so, hey, listen, go get you some grape juice. If you want to get some good wine, go down there and get what they call uh, uh, ocean spray. <laughs> It'll say on the front of the bottle, 100%. Grape juice. Or, what? Welch's. Okay, sorry. Go get you some Welch's. Fine. Go get you some Welch's. And drink as much of that wine as you want to. Okay? You're not going to lead anybody in debauchery. You're not going to cause people to fall. You're not going to cause a curse to happen on society. You're not going to watch the transgressions of men uh, increase. I tell you, you'll sit around, you'll have a good time, you'll drink that stuff, you'll say, man, this is wonderful. But I can tell you what, you'll know when you get bad grape juice, won't you? You'll know it, won't you? Sour, woo, 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 that's no good. But you'll know when you get the good stuff, don't you? Yeah. Now listen, how many of y'all here in your drinking days know this to be true? I know this to be true. That when I went out drinking, it was the first couple of drinks that was the hardest to get down. But after those first couple of drinks, I didn't have any problem with the rest of them. You know why? Because my taste buds got numb. Y'all know what I'm talking about? So it didn't matter if it was in cold or hot. It didn't matter if I was changing drinks or not. It didn't matter. I can guzzle it down then with no problem at all. But I can tell you this, when the governor of the feast got that wine that he got from, that Jesus made, and, and they were already out of what? They'd already, been, they'd already run out of wine, and if it's the wine that y'all all want to claim it is, and that's fine. But they wouldn't have been able to really taste the difference like that. But the governor of the feast immediately, when they hit his lips, said, whoa, 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 where did this wine come from? What vineyard did these grapes grow in? Because I want to go to that vineyard. Remember what I said this morning? The miracle at the Canaan the wedding had nothing to do with the party. It had everything to do with sin. It had everything to do with those six water pots, the purification of the Jews, that filthy, nasty, vile sewer water, and God turned it into the greatest form of grape juice the world had ever tasted. That's how God works, amen. He doesn't bring badness in. He only puts goodness in, amen. And so, man, I'm telling you, this thing is serious, and God's pointing it out. I started society all over, and the first thing that got them was drunkenness. They got a little lax and got a little careless, and the next thing you know, a whole generation of people began to walk in another curse. It's a tragedy, and we make so light of it so often. And so, go back now, Genesis chapter 9. Verse 25, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brother. Not only was he cursed, but he became a what? A slave. They became a slave. You know what God says you are to sin? A slave to sin. You know how hard it is to break a habit once you begin it? And that's why I say I've met a lot of men in rehab. And I can tell you every single one of them says, man, Brother Toby, I wish I'd have never taken the first. Somebody say it with me. I wish I'd never taken that first drink. Because, man, that got me. I'm telling you, man, I just struggled with it. And the next thing I know, man, I, 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 I was messing up left and right. Man, I, I just couldn't get straight, man. Then I lost my family. I lost my home. I lost my job. And all I could think about was getting back to that what? Getting back to that drink. And I know that ignorance because I'm telling you, I'd go out and make a mess of myself on the weekends and, and then I'd, I'd, I'd be so bad and so, so messed up after I woke up and I had such a bad hangover and I'd say, man, I ain't never doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody ever said those words? And like a dog returning to his own vomit next Friday, I was right back on the hunt. 
And this is the seriousness of this issue of alcohol. And for the sake of those who can't handle it, us who say we can, we ought to say, God help us never to touch it again. Help us to bring people out of the slavery of sin and alcohol. Help us to lift people up for the glory of God, not invite them to come on in and maybe fall down the road. For those who walk in darkness stumble. But those who walk in the light, amen, see what they can stumble over. And so I'm just saying, as he picks up and says, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And Canaan shall be, shall ser, shall be his servant. And God shall enlarge Japheth. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servants. I don't know about y'all, but I want God to enlarge us. Amen? I don't know about y'all, but I want the blessing of God. How about you? Say amen. amen. I don't want to be like Ham. I don't want to be cursed for the simple, silly pleasures of this earth as they are fleeting and fading so far away. But I'm going to tell you another thing. Listen, Jesus is your joy. Amen? Jesus is your joy. Jesus is your peace. Jesus is your rest. Jesus is your comfort. Jesus is your guide. Not alcohol. Because I'm going to tell you what alcohol do. It may make it vanish for a minute, but when you wake up, guess what? It's going to be right back in your face again. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, I can give you the peace which surpasses all understanding so that when it's in your face, you still got peace. Amen? Jesus ought to be a joy not found in the bottom of a bottle or a glass of wine. Do not even look on it. When it turns itself the color of red in its cup, and it begins to move itself around. For at last it biteth like a serpent. Don't put the poison in. Solomon, the wisest man on the face of the planet, much wiser than I said, please don't do that. Amen? So, now, once again, people say, well, brother, I, you know, I like to have my glass. And? You're, you're not going to bother me with that. <laughs> You're not going to bother me with that. But I say, please, don't enjoin in other people's sin. And don't entice other people to fall into sin. Amen? You do it, do it alone, and do it for the glory of God. But don't entice others to fall by something they can't control. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this follow-up tonight. And I thank you, Lord, that even though some may disagree, that you're still the Lord of their life. You still love them. You still care for them. You'll still bless them. You'll still go with them. But, oh, God, I pray that for your glory, all of us be willing to say, it's just best to leave it alone. It's just best to walk away. There's so many other things, oh, God, that we can do to help remove all of the stress and worries and burdens of this world. Something much more better to do than to trust the silly, fleeting things of this world. So, oh, God, I pray you'd help us to seek you and seek you like never before. We pray it tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody said. Stand together and sing a grace greater than our sin.